In this first lecture on monitoring, we'll discuss anomaly detection, or is it sometimes also called out of distribution detection. In anomaly detection, we'll try and detect unusual events, novel threats, black swans, long tailed events, unknown unknowns, and so on. For example, we might try and detect an intruder. In a time series, we might try to detect an unusual sequence of events. And in this case of autonomous driving, we might try and detect if there are objects on the road that we've never encountered before and don't yet know how to handle. One motivation for doing anomaly detection research is to put potential dangers on an organization's radar sooner rather than later. Another reason is that when agents encounter an anomaly, they can trigger a conservative fallback policy or a failsafe so that agents act cautiously. Another reason would be to detect novel malicious uses of AI. And in other applications, it can be useful to detect hackers, or it can be useful to detect dangerous novel microorganisms for pre pandemic preparedness and reduce existential risks related to bio risks. Those are some reasons for anomaly detection. To detect anomalies, we'll need a model that can assign each example an anomaly score. Consequently, the anomalous or out of distribution examples should have higher anomaly scores than usual, typical, or in distribution examples. In the figure below, here are in distribution examples assigned anomaly scores and an out of distribution example assigned an anomaly score. As we can see, the in distribution examples have lower anomaly scores than the out of distribution example which is the correct behavior that we would want from an anomaly detector. To assess the performance of an anomaly detector, we'll need a metric. Unfortunately, the typical accuracy metric won't be that useful in this situation. To see the limitations of accuracy, let's consider the following concrete example. Let's assume that we have one anomaly and 99 usual examples. Let's also assume that we have a model that predicts usual always. So this model, irrespective of the input, is always predicting usual, even if the example is an anomaly. It's saying it's usual. Let's analyze this model with the following two by two matrix and abide by the convention that an anomaly is called a positive example. Then a true positive is when an anomaly is detected correctly. And for this model, there are no true positives. A false negative is if an anomaly is ignored wrongly, and in this case, there is a false negative. A false positive is if a usual example is detected wrongly, and in this case, there are no false positives. A true negative is when a usual example is ignored correctly, and in this case, there are 99 true negatives. So the accuracy is 99%. This shows accuracy is not informative enough when there is substantial imbalance between anomalies and usual examples. The difference in accuracy between a model that's functioning well, say one with 100%, and the difference between this completely broken model is just 1%. A model that's outputting usual always is getting 99%, and a flawless model will be getting 1%. When the difference between the metric is uh, the metric between a functioning model and a dysfunctional model is only 1%. This suggests we should use a different metric, or we need to zoom in to the interesting phenomena by measuring it differently. To build up to anomaly detection metrics, we'll need to discuss some background concepts, that of the true positive rate and the false positive rate. The true positive rate, also called the recall, is the true positives over the true positives plus the false negatives. So. There's the set of actual anomalies, and then there's the fraction of those that are actually identified. That'd be the true positive rate. The false positive rate is what fraction of the usual examples are flagged. So if we have the usual examples, that is the non-anomalous examples, how many of those were incorrectly flagged as anomalous? This is the false positives over the true negatives plus the false positives. Now that we have the concepts of true positive rate and false positive rate, we can work up to our first anomaly detection metric, the AROC. But first, let's describe some setup. Let's assume that we're given anomaly scores for each example. So each example is, is assigned an anomaly score. 
And let's assume that we flag the examples as anomalous if their score exceeds a threshold tau. Then, as the threshold decreases and becomes less strict, more examples are deemed anomalous, but at the same time, more usual examples are deemed anomalous. So while the true positive rate increases, so does the false positive rate. We can then see that there's a trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate as we change that threshold. The rock curve depicts the trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Rock stands for receiver operating characteristic, which is a term that comes from radar engineering during World War II. But we continue this terminology in machine learning. So with a random model, if we have a random anomaly detector, the trade-off is the straight line. Meanwhile, if we have a perfect detector, the false positive rate is zero and the true positive rate is one. For a random model, the area under that curve is 50%. And for a perfect model, the area under its curve is 100%. The AROC is the area under this curve, and this is our anomaly detection metric. The higher the area under the curve, the generally better the anomaly detector is. One can think of the AROC also as the probability that an anomaly has a higher anomaly score than a typical example. So if we've randomly sampled a typical example and randomly sampled an anomalous example, computed their anomaly scores, the probability that the anomalous example has a higher anomaly score than that typical example is the AROC. So if the probability is 50%, obviously our anomaly scoring function isn't any good. Meanwhile, if the probability is 100%, we're reliably separating between the anomalous and typical examples. Let's walk through a concrete example that demonstrates how the anomaly scoring function and the anomaly threshold can affect the area under the rock curve. In this example, let's assume we're trying to detect whether a paper is admitted or not. So we're assigning a score as to whether it's admitted. The red pixels are examples that are actually admitted, and the blue pixels are examples that are not admitted. So one blue pixel means not admitted, one red pixel means admitted. So at a anomaly detection score of 0 0.7, there are 50 positive examples admitted. Observe that the red pixels to the right of the line are correct predictions, and the blue pixels to the left of the line are also correct predictions. However, the blue pixels to the right of the line are incorrect and likewise red pixels to the left of the line are incorrect. Recall that the true positive rate is the true positives over all positives, and the false positive rate is false positives over all negatives. Then, if we have the anomaly detection threshold here with this scoring function, we can see that the true positive rate is 20%. The false positive rate, well, there aren't any examples that were falsely flagged, so the false positive rate is 0%. This gives us a point on the rock curve, one at 0, 0,2. Meanwhile, if we change the threshold, the true positive rate and false positive rate increase. So as we've made the threshold be more lenient, there are more true positives and more false positives. This gives us a different point on the rock curve, one of 0 0.5 and 0 0.94. So we can see that the rock curve is showing the performance at various different thresholds. The area under the rock curve is a threshold independent metric. Here's another example where we have an anomaly scoring function that better separates between the two distributions. The true positive rate here is 80% and the false positive rate is 0%. So the area under the rock curve in this situation is generally higher as you can see here. Here's a final example where the anomaly scoring function is a lot worse. The area under the rock curve is almost 50%. If we move the threshold at various different locations, it's not going to make that much of a difference in the ultimate detection quality because we're so poorly able to separate between the two distributions. Let's now cover some of the key properties of the area under the rock curve. The basic one to remember is that a 50% AROC is random chance level while 100% is perfect. 
A debatable, imprecise interpretation of the other AROC values may be as follows. Between 90% and 100%, the AROC could be described as excellent. Between 80% to 90%, good. 70% to 80%, fair. 60% to 70%, poor. 50% to 60%, fail. Of course, the AROC depends on the context. For example, in malware detection, we want a 99.9% .9 plus area under the rock curve, something that's only 90% would be a failure. The error under the rock curve can be interpreted as the probability that an anomalous example has a higher anomaly score than a usual example. Another important property is that the error under the rock curve works even if the anomaly scores are not calibrated. Only the example ordering matters. So if we assign very high anomaly scores to all examples, well, what matters is just how, much, how well the anomaly score separates between the usual examples and the typical examples. If the minimum of the anomaly scores is 90%, that's still fine so long as the ordering separates between the typical examples and the anomalous examples. Or likewise, if the values are small or even negative, that doesn't matter so long as the ordering works. The error under the rock curve also does not depend on the ratio of positive to negative examples. So it's useful when anomalies are far less frequent than usual examples. This is because when computing the error under the rock curve, we're looking at the true positive rate and false positive rate. And the true positive rate is comparing anomalies against other anomalies. And likewise, the false positive rate is comparing usual examples against other usual examples. So this is how the error under the rock curve doesn't depend on the ratio between the positive to uh, negative examples. And then finally, the error into the rock curve is a summary across various threshold levels. In practice, people need to select one threshold. They need to detect whether the example is actually present. But the error into the rock curve summarizes performance across various different thresholds. We do this because we want to build models that work in many different situations. We don't know exactly what practitioners will want to set their detection threshold at. That will depend on the ratio between false positives and false negatives and other statistics. So they'll choose their threshold depending on their practical considerations. We'll want to build a model that's good across various different thresholds. So that's what the AROC can be helpful for. Before discussing our next anomaly detection metric, we'll need to touch on the background concepts of precision and recall. Recall is something we already know. It's the true positive rate from before. It's the fraction of all anomalies that are detected or the true positives over the true positives plus false negatives. Meanwhile, recall is what fraction of detected examples are actually anomalies. So let's look at the set of all detected examples, and then what's the purity or the fraction of that that's actually anomalous? That's the true positives over the true positives plus false positives. To test your understanding of these concepts, note that the boy who cried wolf could be described as a detector. Is he a detector with high recall? or high precision, or does he have low precision or low recall? The boy who cried wolf can be described as a detector with high recall but low precision. So consequently, it's not just enough to have high recall. You also need to have high precision to be listened to. With the concepts of precision and recall, we can look at the precision recall curve. The precision recall curve shows the trade-off between precision and recall at different thresholds. So while the rock curve is plotting the true positive rate against the false positive rate, the PR curve is plotting precision against recall, or the true positive rate. The area under the precision recall curve is something we want to increase. That would be the AUPR, just like with the rock curve. 100% AUPR would be ideal, and at the other end, random performance is not 50%, it's actually approximately the base rate of the positive class. It's not exactly the base rate of the positive class, but it's sufficiently close to that. So we have the area under the rock curve as a way to evaluate the quality of anomaly detection measures, and we also have the area under the precision recall curve too. These capture somewhat different phenomena, but are useful summaries for an anomaly detector's performance. The area under the precision recall curve and the AROC are threshold independent, but in practice, we might need to select a threshold. The FPR95 indicates a false positive rate at 95% recall. 
So this measures the anomaly detection performance at a strict threshold. This is because in practice, we might need to pick a picked threshold. So we'll look at the performance when it's very strict. If we're assuming we need to get 95% of all anomalous examples, what's the false positive rate? On the raw curve, we can look at the trade-off between the true positive rate or the recall and the false positive rate. When the true positive rate or recall is 95%, then we can see the false positive rate between algorithms can differ substantially. In one case, the false positive rate is approximately 80%, whereas in the other case, it's less than 10%. So with the FPR 95, lower is better. Now, of course, 95 is somewhat arbitrary. One could do FPR 99. But commonly, we'll look at FPR 95. It's worth mentioning that the AUPR, AROC, and FPR 95 are not the only anomaly detection metrics. If we were looking at a temporal sequence, for instance, we might prioritize lead time. Some black spawns are hard to spot, and so it's good to have them on our radar earlier rather than later. So if we can have an anomaly detector detect anomalous events earlier, that could also be very valuable. So as you can see, there are multiple metrics for assessing the quality of an anomaly detector. How can we detect anomalous examples? Well, one possibility is to model the probability distribution of the data, and then assign probabilities to those examples, basically get a sense of the density of different examples, and then if the density is sufficiently small, call it anomalous. This idea seems like a good one at first blush, but this actually doesn't work that well in practice currently. For example, let's say we're trying to model the CIFAR 10 distribution, and we're trying to use a pr probabilistic generative model to determine whether examples are anomalous or not. So we're going to model the CIFAR 10 distribution with a model such as, say, pixel CNN++, and that can assign the probabilities to the images. However, if we show it anomalous examples, such as an example from SVHN, which is just basically images of numbers, then it might assign a higher anomaly score to the in-distribution examples rather than the out-of-distribution examples. One intuition for this is that the SVHN images, if you've conditioned on part of the image, it's fairly easy to predict the rest of the image. If we know that the background is generally white, I can predict the vast majority of the remaining pixels fairly well. There isn't that much complexity to predict. Consequently, the P of X models have an easier time making predictions about these simpler SVHN images, and so they end up getting lower anomaly scores than in distribution examples. The AROC in this situation for detecting SVHN images is 15.8. That's worse than chance, which is 50%. On average, the Pixel CNN++ model can do better than chance when detecting various different anomalies on average, but it's not that much better than chance. Therefore, just straightforwardly modeling P of X doesn't currently work that well. A simple method that works better than modeling P of X directly is actually to model p of y given x. So what we could do is we could take a classifier and look at its prediction confidence on the example and use that to detect whether an example is anomalous. So the anomaly score is the negative prediction confidence or the negative maximum softmax probability. This means that lower confidence means it's more likely to be out of distribution or the prediction probability of in-distribution examples tends to be higher than that of out-of-distribution examples. Even though this is a model of predictive information, P of Y given X, or it models how information in X comes together to predict Y, and it's not a model of the information of X itself or P of X, it still is useful for determining whether models or whether examples are anomalous. It tends to achieve area to the rock curves of greater than 70% on various vision, speech, and natural language processing classifiers. So it's more domain independent than one might initially expect. As we can see in this example below, we just look at the prediction confidence, and then we multiply by negative one, and that gives us the anomaly scores. Anomalous examples have higher anomaly scores than in distribution examples. There's some caveats when using the baseline detector. 
The first is that the negative maximum softmax probability may not be that useful for detecting adversarial examples. Recall that adversarial examples are often designed to instill a false sense of confidence in models. So if we're looking at the prediction confidence of models to score, whether it's anomalous or not, or whether it's an unusual example, that may not be so effective in detecting adversarial examples. Another caveat is that some other methods may work better in some situations. For instance, the maximum logit, and recall that the logit is the input to a softmax, taking the maximum over the logits may be more effective than taking the maximum over the prediction probabilities. To see when this might happen, consider the case where there are similar classes and dissimilar classes. So CIFAR 10 has very dissimilar classes. So if we have this picture of this Norfolk Terrier, the CIFAR 10 confidence is very high. It's a dog, clearly. Meanwhile, the ImageNet classifier, since it has a more fine-grained understanding, might know that it's a dog, it might know that it's in distribution, but it can't quite tell whether it's a Norfolk Terrier, or Norwich Terrier, or an Irish Terrier. So the probability mass is dispersed among the similar classes. Even though the example might be clearly in distribution to the model, it still doesn't know exactly what it is. And this would give the sense that the model is less confident that it's in distribution if we're just judging the anomaly scores based on the maximum softmax probability. Meanwhile, if we look at the maximum logit, we don't have this issue. We don't have the probability mass divided among these different classes, or the fact that it's divided among these different classes doesn't play into the maximum logit. It's just whether the model has high affinity for the no fork terrier class, not high affinity for the no fork terrier class relative to, other, relative to the other classes. It's also worth mentioning that people sometimes use different anomaly scores, such as the negative log sum exp of the logits, which is an approximation of the maximum logit. Some people might also use the cross entropy from the softmax distribution to the uniform distribution for anomaly scoring. These various alternative anomaly scores can also be susceptible to adversarial examples, but sometimes they work better in specific contexts. Let's now discuss another anomaly detection score that uses more than just the logits or the probabilities. In the typical classification setup, we can see that the input gets transformed by a network into a penultimate feature embedding, and then those features are multiplied by a weight matrix to give rise to the logits. The logits are fed into a softmax, which gives us the softmax probabilities. But if the penultimate layer dimensionality is greater than the number of classes, then some feature space information is lost when computing the maximum softmax probability or maximum logit. The lost feature space information may be useful for out of distribution detection. So a question then arises, how could we combine feature information with logit information to perform better anomaly detection? A way to capture information about what's typical or atypical in the feature embedding space is with PCA. The idea is to take training examples, look at their embeddings, and then perform PCA on top of that. When we have the top PCA principal components, then that can define a space. We can look at the space orthogonal to that principal embedding space and treat that as the sort of unusual space written P perp. This can give rise to a virtual logit which is proportional to the magnitude of the projection of the embedding onto the space orthogonal to the principal embedding space. So the more that the embedding lives on that space orthogonal to the principal embedding space, the more unusual it is. This virtual logit can be fed into the maximum or is fed into the softmax function, which can give rise to an OOD score. Let's define the virtual logit formula more precisely. We can say that the virtual logit L sub zero equals alpha multiplied by the magnitude of the projection of the embedding onto the feature space orthogonal to P. P perp is the orthogonal complement of P, where P is roughly the subspace spanned by the top principal components of the penultimate layer's training data embeddings. And alpha is defined to match the scale of the original maximum logit. So alpha is equal to the sum of the maximum logits divided by the sum of the norms of the projection of training examples 
onto that orthogonal space. So what this does is it pushes the virtual logit to be on a similar scale to the other logits. Then the virtual logit matching anomaly score is the negative of the vim. The vim is e to the l sub zero divided by e to the l sub zero plus the sum of the exponentials of the other logits. So this can be interpreted as concatenating l sub zero as an additional class and taking the softmax of that and then looking at the prediction probability put on the virtual class, this L sub zero class. It's also worth mentioning that we can compute the anomaly score in a different way. Since the strictly increasing function negative log of one over X minus one preserves the orderings, using the Vim as a scoring function is equivalent to L sub zero minus the log sum exp of the logits. We care about this strictly increasing function, which preserves orderings, because that means the A rock is the same. So if we apply this transformation, the error into the rock curve is not affected. The ordering is the same. Now this negative long sub exp is approximately equal to the negative of the maximum of the logits. So you could interpret this as doing something like the virtual logit minus the maximum logit. So it's essentially accumulating evidence from the feature space that the example is anomalous, and then you're subtracting out the evidence that it is in distribution. That's an intuition for virtual logit matching. Let's discuss some data sets used for assessing the performance of anomaly detectors. One idea is to use research data sets that are lying around. So we could use CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. We'll show how to do this. What you could do is you could treat CIFAR 10 as in distribution and treat CIFAR 100 as out of distribution. Or you could treat CIFAR 100 as in distribution and CIFAR 10 as out of distribution. This is possible because the classes of CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 are mutually exclusive, so they don't have any overlap. We can then train a CIFAR 10 classifier, and then we can show it CIFAR 100 examples and assign anomaly scores to those and hope that the anomaly scores of the CIFAR 100 examples are higher than the anomaly scores assigned to CIFAR 10 test examples. A benchmark for larger scale image anomaly detectors is ImageNet O. With ImageNet O, one treats ImageNet 1K as the in distribution data set, and one treats ImageNet O as OOD. ImageNet O has hard out of class examples. These out-of-class examples are produced similarly to natural adversarial examples, except these classes are to fool in a ResNet 50 model, and the examples don't belong to any of the ImageNet 1K classes. So we take examples known to belong to classes outside of ImageNet 1K, we show it to a ResNet 50 model, the ResNet 50 model assigns confidences to them, and then we keep the examples that have high confidence. But actually don't belong to any of the 1K classes. Why do we use a ResNet 50? That's largely because it's a popular off-the-shelf model and because we've seen with natural adversarial examples that models that end up fooling a ResNet 50 model can successfully transfer to other models as well. The species dataset contains many anomalous species that fall outside of many existing training datasets. So for example, if we train a model with ImageNet 22K, which has 22,000 classes, a very broad image data set, and treat that as in distribution, we can treat species as out of distribution. In the figure below, here are some examples from the species data set. The species data set is derived from the iNaturalist database. The iNaturalist database is continually updating and keeps having more and more images added to it by users who take images of species for fun. So they're going around in nature, and when they encounter a new species, they'll take a picture of it. This data collection effort has been going on for many years and is unprecedented in scale. But despite that, there are many uh, categories for which they haven't observed all the species. Many species don't have a single image observed. Consequently, there are limits to data collection efforts, and there are limits to what can, you can find on the internet. If one proposes to solve anomaly detection by training on all the images on the internet, unfortunately, that won't capture all of the anomalies that can potentially be encountered in the real world. 
even if all the anomalies in the real world were currently depicted on the internet, and there are many examples of each anomaly, that wouldn't imply that anomaly detection is solved because new anomalies will always emerge. New things happen all the time. So those, this gives a good example of some of the limits of doing large-scale pre-training. It doesn't necessarily capture all of the long tail, and the long tail keeps growing as well. The anomaly detection methods discussed so far in the lecture assume a fixed model, and the object is to extract a better anomaly score given that fixed model. Outlier exposure tries to create models that are better at detecting anomalies. The idea is to directly teach networks to detect anomalies. This isn't necessarily easy though, because the challenge is in getting the model to generalize to new anomalies. So while it might be taught to detect some anomalies, if those lessons don't generalize to new anomalies, then this isn't any use. So how can we get it to generalize to new novel events? For the case of multi-class classification, outlier exposure teaches the model to have a uniform softmax output using the following loss. There's a typical classification loss, and then there's the outlier exposure loss. In the outlier exposure loss, we're trying to have the softmax distribution match the uniform distribution through that cross entropy loss. And the examples, the outlier examples, are sampled from some set D sub out. Now, what should that set be? People tried doing Gaussian noise, adversarial examples, or GAN examples. Certainly, those are very anomalous, but unfortunately, those don't teach the model to generalize to new anomalies that well. What works substantially better is using real data for the outlier data set. This often teaches a model to generalize to new anomalies. Let's look at a concrete example. In this case, the in distribution is tiny image net. Tiny image net is like image net, but it only has 200 of image net's classes. One can then make the outlier data set be the remaining 800 classes. If we train models in this way, they end up generalizing to new anomalies. So if we test this model on OOD textures data, then the performance greatly improves. Here's the rock curve. The maximum softmax probability is the baseline. And if we look at the maximum softmax probability, but after we've trained it with outlier exposure, the error into the rock curve increases significantly. Outlier exposure can be useful for more than just image classifiers. It can be also used for generative models. Let's say that the bits per pixel is a negative log likelihood over the number of pixels. And let's say we're trying to change a density estimation model. We could change it by adding the following hinge loss, where we're subtracting the negative log likelihood of the in distribution example and the negative log likelihood of an out of distribution example. And then we're going to add a margin. So if we add this hinge loss to the density estimations objective, this produces a model with better anomaly detection representations. The anomaly score is the bits per pixel. If we look at the typical anomaly score, the error into the rock curve is about 66%. However, if we look at the bits per pixel anomaly score, after training the model with outlier exposure, the error into the rock curve gets to be about 84%. In some extreme cases, like with SVHN, the typical model was getting about 16% AROC against SVHN, while with outlier exposure, it gets about 76%. So at the example at the right, we can see that the earlier issue where the models were giving SVHN images lower anomaly scores than in distribution examples, after we apply outlier exposure, the outlier examples end up getting higher anomaly scores. We looked at outlier exposure for image classifiers and image generative models, but in the paper, you can see that outlier exposure can be used for other domains too, such as natural language processing. If we don't have access to real outliers or outliers that are close enough to the data distribution to learn from, then we can produce synthetic outliers or virtual outliers. One approach is to assume that the in-distribution features from the penultimate layer or the embeddings of the images follow class conditional Gaussian distributions. So what we would do is we would take the embeddings of the image and estimate their means and variances. 
Then we would sample outliers from the low density space and train with those low density outliers as anomalies. So we'd sample from this set V sub K. Visualized, it's the following. There are these class conditional Gaussian distributions. And on the peripheries of these distributions, when the density is sufficiently small, we sample those examples and treat them out as outliers. So the model is training on those generated virtual outliers, and that's teaching it what some anomalous embeddings may look like. An alternative way to study out of distribution detection is one class learning. The idea is to take one class from a data set, such as, say, CIFAR 10, and use the rest as out of distribution data. Now, how could we perform anomaly detection in this case? We can't just take the maximum softmax probability of the classifier. That wouldn't work because the model needed to train only on one class. If it knew all the other classes, then the remaining classes wouldn't be really anomalous. It's seen those during training. So we're going to have to come up with some different methods to deal with one class learning. We can't just rely on pre-existing multi-class classifiers. One way to teach models to perform one class learning is through self-supervised learning. A highly performant, simple self-supervised learning method is rotation prediction. In rotation prediction, what we do is we rotate an image by a multiple of 90 degrees. Then we have the model predict how many degrees it was rotated. The model doesn't see the unrotated image and try and say how much it's been rotated. That would be too easy. Instead, it's just given a potentially rotated image. And it's trying to guess how rotated it has been. So it will try and predict one of four classes. As it happens, this simple prediction task teaches models a lot about the visual world and can help us separate between in-distribution and out-of-distribution examples. It's worth mentioning that rotation prediction doesn't always work for all inputs. For example, if there's a black circle against a white background, you're not gonna be able to predict the rotation. But for many other natural images, there are often many clues that indicate the rotation amount. Here's an intuition for rotation prediction. While it might seem simple at the outset, it forces models to learn some complex shape features. In this example here, the zebra's orientation can't easily be predicted if we just look at the texture. It's difficult to tell whether it's right side up or upside down whenever we zoom in. So consequently, it's going to need some, to know something more about the global structure and shape of the image to perform the rotation prediction. It's easy to repurpose rotation prediction for OOD detection. What we do is we see how well models predict rotations and use the quality of its predictions to detect OOD examples. So we take the input image x, and then we rotate it by 0 degrees, that is, leave it still, rotate it by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. So we do it in all those four ways. And then we see how well the model predicts the rotation. What's the probability that it is assigned to that angle? If the image is in distribution, the sum of these probabilities is likely to be higher. It understands how to predict rotations for the in distribution examples better than it understands how to predict the rotations for out-of-distribution examples. So in this way, the sum of these probabilities can constitute an anomaly score, or that is the negative of the sum of these can produce the anomaly score. Rotations was just one geometric transformation. We can create a better anomaly detector by applying other transformations. We can do vertical translation, and we can do horizontal translation. And then we can sum over the permutations of all these different rotations, vertical translations, and horizontal translations. And this makes it even better at OOD detection. Here results with rotation plus geometric transformation prediction for one class learning. We can see that it's fairly good at out of distribution detection. Its AROC is approximately 90%. It's also doing fairly well in comparison to other anomaly detection methods that we didn't bother discussing in this class, but are nonetheless somewhat well known. This method can also be extended to ImageNet. So this doesn't just work for small scale images. And this can serve as an auxiliary objective for multi-class classifiers. So one can improve one's multi-class classifier anomaly detector with this one class learning loss.
This shows that self-supervised learning can be useful for improving out-of-distribution detection. One can also study out-of-distribution detection using discrete data. For example, in NLP, we could try to determine the domain or purview or provenance of a utility function. The question here would be, does the sentence describe a sentient being experiencing something or is the text about something else? So the utility of somebody saying, I just got hurt, would have negative utility. Meanwhile, the utility of the sentence, the color is red, doesn't really describe any experience. And so there isn't any utility associated with that. It would be rejected as anomalous. Another example is in detecting novel biological phenomena. So the task here would be to classify the genomic sequence or determine if the sequence is from an unknown species. Last, in the case of intrusion detection, the question is, is the computer activity from an approved user or is the activity from an outsider? A research area is at the intersection of OD detection and adversarial robustness. We might want to study these two simultaneously because we want our OD detectors to be adversarially robust. Adversaries could do many things to subvert OD detectors. For example, they could distort OD examples to make detectors make mistakes. That is, they could perturb real OD examples and have the model incorrectly identify them as in distribution. Another possibility is that adversaries could synthesize OD noise that fools detectors. That is to say, they could create artificial OD noise that is identified as in distribution. In both of these cases, these examples would be false negatives. In the example below, here's synthetic OD noise that an adversary fools the model into thinking is in distribution. A related area is error detection. The maximum softmax probability can be used to detect examples that are incorrectly classified. That is, the lower confidence examples are more likely to be classified incorrectly than the correctly classified examples. So the MSP can separate between incorrectly classified examples and correctly classified examples, often with an AROC greater than 80%. However, the MSP baseline is still close to state of the art, which suggests that the error detection problem has lower tractability. Consequently, there hasn't been that much work on this problem.